back, uh, everyone. Um, today in my talk, I want to talk about migration and assimilation. About a decade back, I was at a libertarian conference in the US. A speaker was giving a speech on immigration and he, uh, he asked a question from the audience. He said, what does the audience see from the windows of their planes once their planes have taken off and it has been in air for a few minutes? What he was alluding to was the fact that there are vast open spaces in the US the implication was that given that the US has so much of vast open spaces, why not invite migrants to come and live in the US? He suggested that this would help US economy at the same time helping out these poor people running away from tyrants. At a certain level, he was quite correct, but I felt a sense of anxiety rising in me. It reminded me of the pain of growing up in India. The last thing, ladies and gentlemen, I wanted was to have millions of Indians living around me again. <laughs> yes, I did say that. I did not want to live around Indians again. Remember, when people leave a country, philosophically, they are leaving their people. There's nothing wrong with the land. The land is probably more prosperous there than it is here. It had taken me decades to wean myself off of my indoctrination and cultural conditioning. It was a culture of utter irrationality and superstitions. Might is right was the governing principle. Rationality was conspicuous by its absence. No wonder India was and is a thoroughly wretched, poor, diseased, and a place of pain. In fact, a few years earlier, I had even stopped eating Indian food for several years. This was my way to try to forget what I had been through. <laughs> the problem is that muscles have memories and old habits don't die easily. You have to truly remove yourself from the place you were indoctrinated to undo, to try to, do, to undo the damage. And I don't even know if it's possible. Now there's a speaker who was speaking at this libertarian conference, made my mind speculate on what the US would look like if millions of Indians moved to the US based on his recommendations. Millions of Indians would be peeing and pooping all over the place. <laughs> and filth would generate spontaneously. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you are laughing because sometimes people just don't understand what it means. The reality is, I'm not exaggerating in any way, about 50% of Indians, even today, use the open spaces as toilets. Now, people would be driving all over, often in the wrong direction and even on the sidewalks. quality of workmanship would deteriorate rapidly. Everything would be a patch-up job, a job of expediency. I would be bribing everyone. More importantly, all these Indians who would move to the US would then want to run lives of everyone else. A sense of community and compassion would evaporate from the American society, we would soon ex start exchanging sound bites, sound bites, slogans, superstitions, and irrationalities. That's how you communicate in that country. 
And there would be no mechanism to correct those superstitions and irrationalities. How do you use the tool of irrationality to, dis to reason with someone? I don't know any yet. Every transaction, as a result, would be based on conflicts. For everything would be based on might is right, not rationality. From all that, is spontaneously, a tyranny would emerge. Not too different from the tyranny that exists in India today. Our institutions are merely a symptom of our underlying culture. Our government is merely a symptom of our underlying culture. Those people who spend all their time in activism and fighting the government fail to realize that you have to change your culture before there is any hope. Really, you can move a million Germans to an isolated part of India, and I absolutely guarantee you that that isolated part will start becoming visible on the world map within a few years. Similarly, you can move a million Indians to Frankfurt, and I guarantee you, if not in weeks, in, my, at, in a few months, Frankfurt will start looking like New Delhi. <laughs> if all the equipment would start going wrong, trains will start running late, water and electricity, electricity supply will become unreliable. But why should I depend on imagination? Not far from where we are sitting, a mere 30 minute walk from here is a mini India. It's called the city of Surrey. It's a very sanitized version of India though, but it's a black spot on the landscape of Canada. <laughs> with, with regular shootings, gang warfare, and unsolved crime cases. Those people who live in Vancouver pretty much know what I'm talking about here. Now these people left India, but India never left them. Were Surrey an independent country, it would, from bottom up, develop into a tyranny. This also tells you about the cultural poison that Surrey and Indians provide to the Canadian society. Culture matters. Culture is entrenched. It does not change easily, even if you have changed your country and your environment. It might not change for generations. If at all, it does. But why should I pick on Indians? There's no reason to pick on Indians. The story is pretty much the same if I talk about other South Asians, all of Africa, the Middle East, Central Asian countries, and, uh, and most of Latin America. Now I'm going to, in my talk, collectively refer to these people as the rest. Basically, I'm dividing the world in my talk into two parts, the West and the rest. The West is the Western civilization and the rest is pretty much everything outside the Western civilization. In my talk, I'm going to expand on what immigration of educated and uneducated migrants mean for the, for the West when these migrants come from the rest. And my conclusion will be that these, this migration is hastening the process of degeneration of the Western civilization. My greatest interest will be to highlight a very critical difference between the West and the rest, a very critical difference between the two cultures. And of course, I'm breaking up the world into two 
primary cultures. Now what I'm saying is something that most of your grandparents understood very well, but an understanding and wisdom that has been erased from the minds of people in the West because using the tool of political correctness. So let's examine, let's talk about the less intelligent, uneducated migrants coming to the West. I want to show you a video containing some clips. And I'm sure most of you have seen these clips. Video, please. Now, this, is, this video contains images from Europe. Every day, every minute, they come inside the police. They want to kill each other. We have to, you have to do something. Someone has to protect us. They are in our house. We are the victims. We are not them. We have to live like before. We have to live our life. They took it for us. We're not in war. They are. They have to take them from here. It's a city. It's no place for people like them. A rapidly decreasing minority here. London has got so ethnically diverse that white Britons are now a minority here. Recent police statistics showed that in the capital of Oslo, 100% of assault rapes between strangers were committed by immigrant non-Western males, and 9 out of 10 of their victims were native Norwegian women. The plan risk being labeled racist, fascist, even Nazi. Scores in Swedish schools are plummeting, or if crime in some areas has skyrocketed. I have I want money because uh, I want to uh, smoking and uh, tell and, uh, my mother and the Syrian. Prince is staging a sit-in, refusing to go to an asylum center. You people, before you speak for me, for what you are good, 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 Azir, we go to uh, Germany because Germany is very good. This is their final destination. Ordinary German men and women stood here and applauding them. Extraordinary. People handing them water. Welcome to Germany. How do you feel? This is what the beautiful society of equality and social justice means in practice. Obviously, they will revolt. A person who was demoralized. The Trutli Schüler sind ausländischer Herkunft. The Deutschen sitzen sich immer, sitzen sich immer dahin, dahin. Sind immer allein und so. Und die anderen, wie gehen die mit denen um? So, die schreien auf die, wir treten die, die laufen rum, wenn sie die sehen, geben die einfach schnell so aus Spaß. Die sind viel Gruppe. Und wehren die sich die Deutschen? Nein. Wir haben Angst so. How, how many of you felt a feeling of disbelief, unease and confusion watching this clip? And I'm sure you have watched this, these clips many times. Ah, not many actually. Well, many. Okay. Now, this was subconsciously going on in, in your mind, which was leading you to feel this disbelief, unease and confusion. Why should these migrants instead of feeling gratitude, create an angry nuisance? Why should they destroy public property? Why should they steal from their kind hosts and abuse them? Why should they be fighting among themselves? Aren't they running away from fight? But they seem to be fighting exactly the way they seem to be forever fighting in North Africa, Syria, Afghanistan, Pakistan. These people have starved. They have been abused. They grew up in a totalitarian system. You felt disbelief because you thought that these people would be front runners in the fight for liberty, not only theirs, but yours as well because you thought in your subconscious that because these people have lived under tyranny, tyranny, they would fight against any kind of tyranny. But that's not what you see. 
what is the core reason that might help you connect the dots properly and get rid of your disbelief and confusion? And this is what the main purpose of my talk is today. But I'm going to talk about that once I have talked about the educated migrants next. Again, I'm going to pick on Indians, but that's only because I have a case study of Indians. It does not matter whether it's Indians or people from the rest, other people from the rest. Now, I went to one of the top engineering colleges in India. Most Indians I know in the US my classmates earn very high salaries, much higher than the average American salary. These are very hardworking people. They are very disciplined and very well educated. They work in the very top companies in the US. They pay their taxes, they follow the law, they live in nice houses and they drive big cars. They send their kids to very nice schools. Their kids outperform in mathematics and sciences. And the moms in the evening drive around their kids to make sure that the kids participate in a plethora of extracurricular activities, swimming, ballet, piano, you name it. Now these Indians in the US, the educated, intelligent Indians I'm talking about, tend to be religious but they have a very secular worldview. They are extremely tolerant about other religions, particularly Christianity. And most of these people I know of, they don't do drugs or participate in any illegal activities. They sound like your ideal immigrants. My question is, which side of the political spectrum do you think they voted for? Every one, every single Indian I know in the US voted for Obama in the last two presidential elections. Now, I have no love for the Republican Party, but I do want to understand why these Indians voted for Obama. These Indians support Obamacare, despite the fact that they can afford private health care themselves. They are at the forefront of fighting for higher salaries for teachers. And when I ask them what higher salary is decent salary, they can't define it. They want to outlaw guns. And these Indians, almost every single Indian I know in the US, would give the police right to accost people on the street and interrogate them, even if there is no evidence against those people. These Indians in the US, again, intelligent, smart, well-paid people, want massive control over the industry. Most of them, of course, work in the IT industry. This is the worst thing. They have no problems in extrajudicial killing of alleged criminals without the due process of law. As Mr. Schaefer will explain to you probably that any country that does not treat its criminal fairly cannot be a civilization. These Indians, I know, tend to uncritically trust the US government and want it to do more. They unquestionably accept US interference in the Middle East and in Africa. These Indians, again, the rich, smart ones, I'm not even talking about the poor, illiterate ones, show groveling respects, respect for politicians and treat them as celebrities. These politicians are invited as chief guests to community functions of these Indian communities. And I'm sure you must have watched videos of American and Canadian politicians dressed in Indian garb, trying to collect votes from Indians. Now, if you process what I have just said, even these very educated Indians contribute to making the West 
a mirror image of India. They vote, they vote for increase in regulations to control lives of other people. They vote for big nanny government. Indians have brought to the US educated smart Indians exactly the same worldviews that has made India an utterly dysfunctional place. Now as full participant in the matrix, Indians are productive members of the society in the US. This cannot be said for their contribution in the realm of philosophy and public policy. And ladies and gentlemen, it is philosophy that dictates the long-term direction of any society. Again, I'm merely using Indians as a case study. But people who themselves are or whose ancestors came from the rest, and again, the rest is pretty much everything outside the West, vote overwhelmingly, have, look, have a look at the statistics, for a big nanny government. There's a huge influence of tribalism and irrationality among these voters. Let me give you some numbers here. In the last US presidential elections, 93% of African Americans voted for Obama. 71% Hispanics voted for Obama. 73% Asians voted for Obama. Now some of you might have been thinking, why have I not mentioned Islam so far? Now those who oppose immigration mostly worry about Muslims. And they are not wrong. The problem is that they have defined their prob the problem, the real problem, very narrowly. And I'm going to define the problem actually in a broader way when I come to my conclusion. They have defined the problem so narrowly they can, that they cannot see forest for the trees. In fact, until 9-11, they could not even see a tree. <laughs> what happened, ladies and gentlemen, if you think about it is that after 9-11, talking about Islam has come out of the realm of political correctness and you can take all your frustration out on Islam. Again, nothing wrong in blaming Islam and that is certainly a big part of the problem. But ladies and gentlemen, the problem is much wider and if you don't understand the forest, your understanding of the trees won't help you understand anything. So what is the wider problem? Don't forget, I already talked about the huge crime problem in the city of Surrey in Canada. And there's a huge entrenched problems with First Nations, black communities, and Latinos in the US. But Americans mostly start suffocating when you want to discuss problems with these communities. Now my job is not to give an exhaustive list of all the problems that there are in the world, in the Western world. But my only interest at this point is to show that the problem is much larger than the problem of Islam. Again, the problem is there with Islam, but the problem is much larger, much wider, much deeper. I recently visited the no-go areas in Sweden about two months back. These are the places no white person can enter anymore. Even ambulances and fire brigades cannot enter those areas without police escorts. I went with a police es escort. Such places are filthy and dangerous. Now, this is the same country, exactly the same country, which I went to about 20 years back. Those days, people would come and talk with me on the street because I was a novelty. Those days, a 16-year-old girl could go out late in the night by herself pretty much anywhere in Sweden and not have to worry about anything. Not anymore. 
I visited refugee areas in Utrecht, in Holland, where Dutch government is building another massive refugee center. Just at the entrance of this refugee center, few, many houses had been shut down. Why? Because prostitution of underage girls and human trafficking had gone wild in that area. This is Holland, even they got scared of what has started happening. During a talk with my blonde Dutch female friend, she suddenly realized that even without realizing it, she had started wearing very conservative clothes over the last few years. Now that's true that most of the, these refugees in Europe, the current refugees are Muslims. But here is the problem. It might make you folk look at the problem very narrowly. In my view, the situation would not have been much different were they Christian refugees from Africa, or Hindu refugees from India, or Buddhist refugees from Myanmar. Don't forget that the biggest genocide right now happening is likely happening in Myanmar against Muslims. But why should I talk with you about communities that are distant to you? Why should I talk about Europe? Americans actually should know better. Can anyone guess here how many women and girls crossing the border from Mexico to the US get raped on the way? Anyone can make a wild guess on it? Give me a high number. 92. Sorry? 92. Right, okay, so that's very close. 80%, 80% women and girls on the way from Christian Mexico to the US get raped on the way. Imagine the kind of culture that allows this to happen. I'll show you another video which will probably suffocate you, but I'll show you nevertheless. I think we can stop the video. Did you, did you think that segregation had stopped in the US? Okay, so, that, so ladies and gentlemen, Islam is a problem. It's a huge problem. I'm actually not even sure if removing that problem per se would actually improve anything. But at least in the context of this talk, Islam is only a small part of the whole problem. It's a problem with people, not only mig new migrants from the rest, but even people with ancestry in these areas. The problem, as I said, is the people from Middle East, South Asia, Africa, and a lot of Latin America. So I want to get to the core of the problem here. What is, why did you feel this disbelief when I showed you the first video? And for that, I have to take you back about 2,500 years, two and a half millennia back. At that time, Greco-Roman philosophers discovered the concept of reason. <coughs> Using the vehicle, and Doug Casey would probably disagree with it, and I don't really have that good grasp on, and I doubt if anyone has a good grasp on how things actually happened. But aided by the environment, the concept of reason got infused into the European culture. Ladies and gentlemen, while the concept of reason might look like a natural state of being to you, particularly to those who grew up in the West, it wasn't that simple. It wasn't that easy. 
It was a process that took about two millennia. That's how the concept of reason probably took to sink in in, the, in Europe. And often there were still serious setbacks, including two major ones just a century back. But about 500 years back, something, the visible changes, visible expressions of this concept of reason had started to appear in European society. You had Reformation and Renaissance, the age of reason, the scientific revolution, the industrial revolution, and the age of enlightenment. And if you think about it, none of this has yet, to, has yet, has yet happened outside the West. What you see around you as accumulated financial and intellectual capital in the West, and when I say West, I of course means, mean Europe, North America, Australia, and New Zealand. What you see as the accumulated financial and intellectual capital holds together because of one reason, and that is the concept of reason. I don't know how many of you go to poor countries, but their villages and cities look like war zones, even if they haven't had a war for decades or centuries. And the reason is that if you are irrational, capital does not stay there. It get, tends to get dissipated. It is from morality, it is from rationality that morality emerges. It is from rationality that a society learns to differentiate between right and wrong. God, ladies and gentlemen, did not send you a book on ethics. It is from reason that you learn to differentiate between virtues and sins. Only rational people are capable of understanding Ten Commandments. Unfortunately, the concept of reason has made almost no influence on countries in the rest. And remember, there has been massive amount of interaction between the West and the rest over the last 500 years. There has been trade and movement of people. In the last 100 years, this interaction between the rest and the West has gained pace. Travel has become much cheaper, and in the last 30 years, because of cheap internet, access to knowledge and information has become virtually free and available to anyone who wants it. And you thought that knowledge and wisdom would get transmitted from the West to the rest? So far, it hasn't happened. The irrational societies, ladies and gentlemen, are immoral. They are incapable of respecting virtues. Irrational people see no need for being grateful or of being virtuous. Shall I repeat that? Irrational people are incapable of being grateful or of being virtuous. That should help you understand the first video that I showed you. The irrational behavior that you see comes across as strange and believable only as long as you don't understand that you're dealing with utter irrationality. You're dealing with operating systems in the mind that are irrational and completely alien to you. Now you might ask, haven't a lot of people around the world got westernized in Thailand, in Sri Lanka, in India? Now what ladies and gentlemen they have copied are the superficial aspects of the western culture. The clothing, music, films, entertainment, and political activism. This is the problem. The concept of reason somehow never got transmitted from the west to the rest. The eyes of these people in the rest simply fail to see the concept of reason. They simply cannot see or understand what made the West great. They just think that it's Kim Kardashian or Paris Hilton that makes America great. 
They simply cannot see, and they copy Kim Kardashian and Paris Hilton in these countries, but they get no, they, have, they lack the possibility of understanding the concept of reason, and that is why the concept of reason is, stays predominantly a Western concept. In short, ladies and gentlemen, most of the rest it still lives in irrationalities and superstitions. Whether you see them as that way or not is a different thing because your eyes might fool you because how they dress up and what music they listen to. Let me conclude my talk here. In my view, the problem is not, and I want to redefine the problem, the problem is not of migration. The problem is of cultures. Cultures do not mix. And there are two kinds of cultures in the world, culture of rationality and culture of irrationality. The Western civilization is based on the concept, on the, on the culture of rationality. It is the only civilization based on reason. Most of the world outside the West continues to wallow in superstitions and irrationalities. My personal guess is that they have actually been disincentivized from becoming rational. And the reason is that they got the free gift of technology from the West without actually having to work for it. They take too much credit for their economic growth, but most of that is a result of technology transfer, not of anything else. People of the West and people of the rest have different operating systems in their brains. They process the same information differently. These, these two people seem to philosophize and communicate, but they don't. This does not change even after generations, even after people have moved from one society to another, even after they have gone through Western education. So just before I end my talk, I have I wanted to talk more about something else, but I don't have the time for it. So I'll just leave you with that conclusion. But I can talk about it in, if you have any questions on it. Many people think that what is happening in the West, it will be Europe that will degenerate faster. But if you redefine the problem the way I have defined, which is that the problem is not of migration, but of culture, you might start to see that it is the U.S. that will degenerate faster. And my view, U.S. might have even gone past the tipping point. You will know about it in a few years' time. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. Yes, sir. Uh, Where would you place Russia, China, and Japan? Rest or West or um, Well, uh, you know, I was, uh, if you, uh, I spoke about the rest a bit smartly. I avoided talking about um, Russia, China, Japan, uh, and Korea. Um, I, but remember, even Japan, which has been probably the most enlightened country outside the West, Despite the fact that it has it copied the Western civilization very actively, hasn't really come out of its problems really. Uh, but uh, I think there's hope from Japan, Korea, and China, and um, Russia, probably in between somewhere. Hi. Um. I was just wondering if, in your opinion, is there some way for cultures in the rest to adopt the facets of reason to become more enlightened in the future? So, um, you see, missionaries, uh, and I have no love for um, Catholic missionaries, but um, these were the people who actually did a good job. They tried to change societies from bottom up by actually trying to change the culture of these people, the way they thought, the way they did things. Um, trying to force changes from the top just does not work. Uh, 
you, if you remove one superficial problem, you end up with many other superficial other problems in those societies. Um, but even Catholic missionaries, despite that they worked very hard in these countries, pretty much reached a plateau. They could not really change a lot after a while. So I don't have a solution to that. My interest was to merely present, portray a picture of the problem that exists. Yes, Michael. I understand the divide, <coughs> reason and irrationality, but is there an actual war on reason? Okay. Is, there any, is there a war on reason? Um, well, those people who can't even comprehend the concept of reason, where the, in their brains the reason, the, the word reason makes no impact. How can there be a war on reason? So uh, I, I don't see a war on reason anywhere. Uh, you see, the, the big problem in my view is that these societies are based on tribalism. You create instability in these societies and violence has to happen to bring them to a new stage of stability. And that's what you face in, in the Middle East today. That does not mean that by letting, so they have to have their tyrants. There's no other way for them. If you remove their tyrants, they will get, go through a lot of violence to go through a re-stabilization process, a negotiate agreement as a result of violence rather than reason. And this will always happen in these countries as long as concept of reason hasn't reached them. So far it hasn't, and my experience tell me, it's actually getting worse, not better. They have copied all the entertainment aspects of the Western civilization. They have completely failed to understand who Doug Casey is. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Paul here. We have exchanged uh, many emails and comments uh, over the internet, so you kind of know my opinion on things. But uh, I think there's one particular group that is separate. And in, within the rest, there's one particular group that has an agenda, that has a book. And in this book, the book says that we are the enemy. Uh, I, a friend of ours, married, uh, she's, uh, she's a lady from Canada, and she married this American fellow from New York. They went to Kuwait, and she was a teacher. She tried to teach little boys and girls, teaching English and uh, other things, and these little boys and girls turned to her and said, my parents say, I cannot be your friend. You're an infidel. I cannot, and, and, and that changed her because she had the typical political correctness of a teacher in Canada, and uh, she absolutely changed. She came, and changed, came back a changed woman. I find that this is disturbing. Uh, I think the, the, the rest that is not under Islam uh, has a chance of somehow miscegenation, it's called, the, it's a blending. Uh, but the Islam has a directive not to. Well, yeah, I, I've, I don't have anything against you on what you said. Uh, Islam probably is worse than what else is there. But uh, in my view, there's not a huge amount of difference. Just about everything that happens in Pakistan happens in India. The only thing is that when something happens in Pakistan, it goes to the front page here. And when it hap the same thing happens in India, it goes to the bottom of the sixth page. Um, so I'm not even sure. In fact, if you look at the situation in the rest, the only countries, except from Ch China, Japan, and Korea, the only countries that have done better uh, among these rest are Muslim countries, Turkey, Malaysia. But look at Africa, look at uh, South Asia, India. Uh, they are still wallowing in huge amount of uh, problems. Uh, so just the last one, actually. Hi. Um, 
It's uh, something that's come to my attention over the last couple of years that sometimes people will say things, like usually it's an atheist, who will say, um, well, uh, that person's a Christian. They're, they've usually come from another culture. Uh, and so um, I'll say, oh, interesting, I, I had no idea, I've never heard them talk that way, that, to suggest they were. And what they really meant was they were referring to a culture, they come from a Western Christian type culture. Um, and similarly, I think sometimes uh, we in the West are a little confused as well, um, looking at other cultures that may be associated, say, with Islam. And we say, well, um, boy, they're god awful. And uh, they're also um, maybe even claimed to be uh, Muslims. But in fact, if, uh, people who have claimed to be Christians are god awful. And I think ultimately, before a person um, decides on um, what the implications of a, of a religion are, like Islam or Christianity, that really one has to understand um, the, uh, the school of thought that the scriptures themselves indicate, as opposed to what the people who um, purport to reflect them um, uh, say about it. So for instance, if I'm a Christian and I nuke your city, um, that may, or may not say so much about what Christianity is about. Um, and so, when we're talking about cultures, I think it's important to say, oh, recognize that, yeah, that, that's a culture where people claim to be maybe Islam, uh, Muslims, um, but perhaps Islam is not really reflected that much in their attitudes and the way they speak. And so I just want, there's no question there, it's just a comment that I think that it, I, I'm reluctant to, um, to attribute to a religion uh, what I see in individuals. I see a lot of people who are People would say are Christians, I would say they're not Christians, they're fake Christians, they're, they're, they're something else, and the same with any religion. Well, in my view, people choose uh, their religion based on uh, how their mind works. So, um, the less enlightened people might choose Islam, a slightly more enlightened people might choose Christianity, and maybe more enlightened people might choose uh, atheism. I don't know, I'm not saying I'm, I'm smarter than other people, but uh, because there's a lot of statists among atheists. But what I'm saying is that which one is the horse and which one is the cart? Is the culture and the kind of people the horse, in my view, and the religion come next? They pick and choose what works for them. Christianity probably had a lot of bad aspects of it, but these people gave up on the bad aspects of it and moved on. Um, so. Uh, so I think uh, Islam could have done exactly the same thing, and it has in some areas. Uh, Malaysia, again, is one of the probably a better example in which, from what I have seen, um, uh, it's a very moderate country. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, we will break up for five minutes. Uh, we just want to reset the tables a bit, and then uh, if you could come back in five minutes, please. Thank you. Mm -hmm.